Thomas Chatterton Williams. TC Dubs. Can I call you TC Dub? TC Dubs. TC Dubs works. They used to call me T Dubs. <laughs> TC Dubs. It is then. T Dubs. T Dubs was also like what <laughs> my college classmates I, called me. Were they really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think TC Dubs. Because the C is very dignified. No offense, Thomas Williams. How many Thomas Williams are there on the planet? One billion, two billion? <laughs> so, so when I was living in Brooklyn and I was setting up my Wi-Fi in my apartment in Bushwick, I, it, I, it, I somehow became aware that there were not only 80 Thomas Williamses in my <laughs> uh, zip code in Brooklyn, there were 80 Thomas Williamses <laughs> with criminal records <laughs> <laughs> i believe it so, i believe it but how many name. thomas shatterton williams with criminal records probably no more than a dozen right <laughs> i would say zero. zero i'm gonna go with zero <laughs> <laughs> well this is cool I, I this is exciting this is the first episode of the podcast i think what the world needs is another podcast i agree I i'm think, always running out yeah America already has more guns than people. I think we should have more podcasts than guns. <laughs> so now we're part of it. Isn't this exciting? Everybody do their part. Exactly. Um, before we start talking about stuff that actually matters, and we will get to that, I, I, is it cool if we start with something that 100% doesn't matter at all, but that drove me kind of insane this week? Yeah, fire away. All right. Just one thing, just one sentence in one article uh, in the New York Times, an op-ed called Biden's Succession Problem by Greg Craig. Otherwise, a pretty good article, I thought. But it had this one sentence in it that went like this. Many experts agree that Mr. Biden is much more likely to die within the next decade than a man 10 years younger. <laughs> one more time, just in case you missed that. Many experts agree that Mr. Biden is much more likely to die within the next decade than a man 10 years younger. They called experts to confirm that an older man is more likely to die than a younger man. <laughs> Why? <laughs> And and which experts? Who is? Uh, how do you have who expertise? Takes call? Who takes that call? Actually, when the <laughs> Times is calling, I, you get, they call the head of NASA, and they're like, "Yeah, that's that's true." That checks. You could out. call anybody. Like, hey, you're the inventor of cheese whiz. Who's more likely to die, old guy or young guy? Like, you know, <laughs> old guy, obviously. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, some things can be a little bit too fact checked and a little bit too. <laughs> so there's only so many uh, T's to be crossed and I's to be dotted. Uh, but I actually thought the, the the piece was interesting in a way because it was calling for something that, you know, you, you, we become used to the way that politics is done and we forget to realize that it could be done otherwise and has been done otherwise in the past. And the piece was calling for a kind of you know, a, a, a different way of thinking about nominating the vice president if we were to get behind Biden and support him in 2024. And that would be actually, I think, a way of making um, the, the, the primaries uh, or making the election more exciting and getting uh, voter enthusiasm up to the levels that it will be on the Republican side. If, if you tell me that's what the piece was about, I believe <laughs> you. Unfortunately, I don't know because my brain imploded when I read that sentence. <laughs> I thought the two paragraphs that came before that were good. <laughs> yeah, I well, I mean, it, it's a real problem, though. Joe Biden, he's old. He looks. I agree. Really, he's really old. old. He's a reminder that we live in a gerontocracy. It's not just his yeah. fault. It's not just his problem. It's the Supreme Court It's everywhere you turn is Congress. But I don't blame him for being old. I don't blame him for being old. That's not his fault. <laughs> it's not his fault, but. He's a, he's a visual reminder of where we are, I think, as a society. And, and I'm not sure. I, 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 oscillate. I, don't, I wonder what you think. I oscillate between thinking, you know what, um, he's doing a good job. I think in, by many measures he is doing a good job. Um, uh -huh. he's, he, he's actually pretty strong and pretty uh, inspiring on Ukraine and other issues. But mm -hmm. at the, on the other hand, I mean, 82 years old? Uh, Somebody, yeah. So I, I also like Biden. I, I'd give him a B plus. I think he's doing pretty well. I voted for him. Certainly don't regret that vote. Um, I did a mailbag column on my, my sub stack. I might be wrong. And somebody asked, do you think he should run again or is he too old? And because I try to tell the truth, you know, at least 70% of the time on my sub stack, I had to say, yeah, I think he's too old. I wish somebody else would run. I, li I like him, but to think of how he's going to be in... 2028, which is, 
you know, that's yeah. the last full year of yeah. a second term. Yeah. That's that's way out there. At the same time, um, I'm 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 hesitant to hate because he's younger than my dad. And I think my, <laughs> I, I think my dad's doing well. I, I mean, my dad's not confronting Vladimir Putin. He's dealing with other issues. But yeah. You know, it's, he's, it's, your dad's not confronting Vladimir Putin. Boy, he's asleep at the wheel. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, TC Dub Sr. We, we need everyone behind this. He's got other I'll say this, though. Counter argument. <laughs> Joe Biden is older than my father and my father's deceased. So so that's okay, old. So there, it doesn't so get any older than that. For, for the older you are, the more likely you are to be deceased. There that is, is an argument. Well, for, you said it was fact check. You know what? It is true. It is true. Yeah. That checked out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man should we get into this we, we can't uh talk about joe biden's impending corpse for the entire podcast we got important things to cover dilbert is racist did you know that dilbert is racist Tom, i don't mean the cartoon i mean the person dilbert is racist <laughs> did you know that <laughs> uh i did know that actually unfortunately i i've become aware of uh the creator of dilbert scott adams through his twitter persona. yeah a- So that's the thing that throws you for a loop. Apparently, the human who draws Dilbert is named Scott Adams. I just find that confusing. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to call him Dilbert, if that's okay. I think that's easier. Okay, so let's talk about what Dilbert did. Dilbert uh, went on YouTube. He apparently has a YouTube show. Like I said, everyone in America has a podcast, so he went on his. And in response to a super weird, we can't get into this too much, but he's a super weird Rasmussen poll asking people, is it okay to be white? Which, by the way, had an error in the own the, their own tweet they sent out about the poll. But apparently, fifty three percent of Black people answered yes to the question: "Is it okay to be white?" It's a super weird poll. This sent Scott Adams on. I'm sorry, Dilbert, on a rant. <laughs> and why don't I just read what he said? This is this is me quoting here. This is let me say that one more time. This is me quoting. <laughs> yeah, Dilbert protection in that quote. <laughs> this is not me. I don't want to get canceled cover this early in the podcast. Yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll still get edited out of context. Did you hear what Maurer said on the <laughs> first episode? Anyway, Dilbert, quote, in nearly half of all blacks are not okay with white people. That's a hate group. I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I would say, based on the current way things are going, the best advice I would give to white people is to get the hell away from black people because there is no fixing this. End quote. Thomas, I would call that refreshingly racist because I didn't have to expend any mental energy figuring out if it was racist or not. Yeah. And one of the more bizarre things is that he keeps doubling down saying that everybody who understood what he was saying in context agrees with him, black, white, Latin, anything else. If you heard him in context, you agree, but, but, but it's only people who heard that out, out of context that he's arguing for kind of like, um, Neo segregation. Only the people that heard that heard this out of context <laughs> find it objectionable, uh, which is which is just a bizarre defense. I mean, you have to be careful that you don't take people that are clearly trolling um, too seriously, and you yeah. go for the bait. You know, I spent a few days on Twitter, kind of getting into random back and forths about this, but I think it is actually interesting because it's not ambiguous. Always the a good use of time. It's pretty clear when you're arguing for segregation, when you're, when you're labeling an entire 44 million person deep population as a hate group. I mean, it's pretty clear that you're saying something that uh, violates well-established norms about um, bigotry. And yeah. so, you know, the, the, it taps into this wider conversation about cancel culture. And it, it's what's so what's so frustrating about this moment is that, you know, both the left and the right kind of want to make cancel culture a thing that there's no nuance on. So 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 on the left side of this debate, there's a kind of reaction where it's like, oh, wait a minute. So you want to call that cancel culture? Well, then you're a hypocrite because all these other things that you call cancel culture that you don't agree with, you know, you just, you're just picking and choosing which uh, violations um, you, you, you don't, um, you don't have a problem with. And then right. it can be, the, the, the argument can be made from the other side as well, that there should just be a free for all and there should never be any cancel culture. And, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, we don't have to actually debate about whether an argument for segregation 
is something that could come with reputational harm. I mean, that was what Scott Adams was saying in the Washington Post article that was going around, is that like, it seems mm-hmm. like his reputation has been harmed. And he was making it seem as though that was an unfair outcome for what he had said. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it, what do you well, do, right, is, right, Has a discourse right. just been hijacked to a point where there's no way to actually engage with, you know, something so clearly uh, articulated to offend if you just respond, you're already losing. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, you know, a, a lot of people came at you on Twitter because you are a guy who writes a lot about, I mean, this isn't a phrase you use, but cancel culture is a phrase other people use. Cancel culture. And uh, you have often argued for, you know, widening the lane of what's permissible to say. And my, my, my view, and, you know, I've also written about this some, though a lot fewer people read me than you, but I never thought, and, and I also don't use the term cancel culture, but when I have complained about an atmosphere of censoriousness, which is obviously a mm-hmm. big problem in comedy, and a world in which people are very afraid to say what they think because they're afraid of the mm-hmm. reputational and professional consequences that are going to come from that, I feel that the it's it's never been the case that, well, there should be no rules and just anything you say, everyone has to take it and just smile along with anything you say. no. Um, I, I always thought the problem is an extreme narrowing of what's acceptable to say, uh, right. m- making it so that you must repeat this script and this script has very definitive points and there is no room whatsoever for an idea that might be a little bit outside of the bounds of the norms. And I would say what's different about what Dilbert did here is that he is way outside the bounds of, of what I find acceptable. And I, I admit I did not watch the whole YouTube clip. That doesn't sound like fun. That doesn't sound like something I want to do. Maybe there is exonerating context. I set up this quit, this quote saying, I'm quoting, I'm quoting, I'm quoting. Maybe he did the same thing. I, I doubt it. Um, but to me, what he said was, I, I think that's extremely clear racism. And uh, I now in fairness, me boycotting Dilbert is super easy. I didn't even know it was still around. So I honestly didn't either. Um, that's the other thing. It's just that he's, I actually got dragged into listening to his entire interview with Hotep Jesus, which a oh lot God. of, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of people saying that he was taken out of context that if you just listen to him, explain himself on, on that podcast, you'd understand where he's coming from. It didn't make him look better. He basically says he's 65 years old and he's ready to to light his career on fire. He's got enough money and, you know, he, <laughs> well, he, he succeeded he on the free speech. <laughs> I don't think it's this free speech issue, though. You know, it really we're, we're mixing up a whole lot of issues here. You know, this is this is basic racism that you know, decades ago would, would, would be objectionable. It's, it's, it's trolling. You know, he said he likes attention. He loves to have the kind of hatred, uh, directed at him. He loves to be trending. You know, it's, he's a provocateur. Um, it's not, cancel culture is a really complicated thing. I don't like the term, but we all know the phenomena that we're referring to when we use the term. I think it depends on a lot of variables to actually fall into this, this zone that, um, is a kind of informal censoriousness that we need to actually take quite seriously. It involves social media mobs. It involves the transgression of not yet established norms. It usually involves pressure campaigns on a person's employers. And it also usually involves uh, an effort to make somebody, um, uh, to, to associate somebody with a stigma to such a degree that they won't just lose their current employment, but they, they become kind of untouchable. Right. And, you know, right. it's, it's often applied to people that are quite um, already successful and, and pretty insulated. Dave Chappelle, J.K. Rowling, lots yeah, of people right. like that. But, that's the, but the main, the, the truly um, disturbing aspect of what is called cancel culture is the onlooker effect. So it's not that you can cancel J.K. Rowling or Dave Chappelle, but it's that the next comic coming up, seeing how Dave Chappelle is catching it, uh, is going to really, as you said, narrow what they allow themselves to even think is permissible. The next writer coming up who doesn't have the resources of a Jake Rowling is going to think a lot harder about even saying something that they believe to be true if it could trip this kind of this kind of mob. The thing that's so 
kind of nefarious about it is that it operates with the logic of a sucker punch. You never know when you're tripping over the over the informal yeah. boundary because it's in the process of being established. That's why what Scott Adams does really falls short to me. It's just racism, you know, and racism, you know, you your, your, your speech is protected, but it does. That does actually come with, you know, you, you, you videotape yourself saying something that's pretty clearly established as racism and people have a right to react to that. You don't really get to play yourself off as a victim, yeah. pass yourself off as a victim. Yeah, I really agree that one of the scariest things is the gray area because you're all, always wondering, oh, if this is somewhere in the gray area, could could right. this be a problem for me? As somebody who presently writes for a network television show, let me tell you, so much stuff gets struck because it just might be in the gray area. You're always, I, I'm always wondering, like, who who would that offend? You know, I'm writing stuff that I think is like so innocuous, and it's always jokes. So it's like, all right, you lose one joke, just write another. But it's like, who who would that offend? And the network's opinion is often, I, you know, I don't know, but like, just to be safe. I don't know why that's offensive. I don't know who that might offend. But the gray area is so vast that, yes, it really does um, yeah, cause I people want, to bite I want to ask tongue. you that. With that imaginary sensitivity reader looking over your shoulder, what does that do to the creative <laughs> process, to the, to the artistic comedic Murs process? It. Murs, it strangles it. In, or maybe a better description would be, you know, in uh, Fight Club, when Ed Norton just wails on that blonde guy until he's got like no eye left yeah. in his socket <laughs> yeah, and he's yeah. just laying there bleeding on the ground. That's basically what it does to the creative process. I mean, because you're writing out of, especially for comedy, because you're writing out of a place of fear. And it's, and who, uh, who it's, who it's, actually it's wants that. It cannot be that the, it cannot be that the people who are producing the content actually want the comedic element to be deadened. Uh, no, I, I don't know. I don't know who it serves, honestly. I, well, okay. Here's, here, here's the, the real answer to the question. All right. If you have somebody in a process, in my case, it's a television network and their job is flag anything that might get us in trouble. Well, they're mm-hmm. going to, they're going to flag everything. Right. Because their only job is make sure we don't get in trouble. They don't get a reward for letting something through and they think it's okay and then it does turn out to be okay. No, they get nothing for that. They only get in trouble if something gets through and it was not okay. So they just flag everything. And I'll tell you one weird, and by the way, it's not like unique to, I've worked at a couple different shows. It's, like, it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's not one network. It's everywhere. Right. One really super weird thing that happens is you'll have a writer that's not a straight white guy like me. It's so non-white or gay or whatever. And they'll write a joke about, you know, something in, inv- they're never racist jokes, but like involving, you know, black writer writing a joke that involves black people, a gay writer writing a joke that involves a gay person. And then the cisgendered straight white guy at the network will flag it and go, no. And then you've got the, you've got the non-white writer like going, what the hell? I, how did I just get vetoed by a white guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's like it, you're talking about the incentive structures that are created where somebody's whole job is to find things problematic. So they'll find them, um, mm-hmm. whether or not the the audience needs that or whether or not even the non-white uh, so-called marginalized creators desire that. Um, but I also wonder, outside of your role as a comic, I wonder, as a straight white guy, do you think it is OK to be white? In America do, today, <laughs> do I think you're giving me the Rasmussen poll question? Yeah, is it okay? Yes, for, is it okay I think, to be yes, white? I think it's okay to be white. <laughs> I think the, I think the answer to the question is it okay to be fill in any race is yes across the board, including <laughs> white. You mean like it's okay, like to, to <laughs> you don't have to feel ashamed of immutable characteristics that you're born with. Yeah, well, I don't think I, I, I have been born with immutable characteristics on account of my race. I mean, <laughs> I have characteristics. I, I, do, do you think how much how much trouble am I getting in for that answer for from from you and from other people? You're you're getting in no trouble from me. But so what 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 the the question? There is a problem with what Scott Adams said, but there's also a problem with the kind of trolling uh, polling question as well. You know, the the, the Rasmussen um, wording was already. Um, guaranteed to to confuse people, seemingly on purpose. You know, there's this mm-hmm. slippage um, in all of these conversations. There's a slippage 
between the meaning of white as, you know, referring to specific uh, ethnic and so-called racial groups yeah. um, from Europe and sometimes referring to, to people of Arab descent as well on the American census. And also this notion that's become more and more mainstreamed in the past, you know, decade at least, but, you know, this notion of whiteness as something that is not referring to specific people, but is a construct that operates as a kind of form of privilege and power in a racialized society. And so when you just say, is it okay to be white? I think that what happened was that a lot of people actually were really confused by the question. It was reflected in the numbers. You know, people aren't mm -hmm. sure if you're referring to to my white friend over here or, the, or, or right. uh, you know, or right. whiteness itself, which 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 acts as like a kind of domination in this in this way of thinking about race, and so that already like kind of you know makes the answers meaningless. But you know also something like t more than twenty percent of white people responded to the poll saying yeah. that it's not okay to be white, <laughs> yeah. you know, and lots of other non-white and non-black people the um, expressed ambivalence about whether it's okay to be white. It's very strange that Scott Adams used that weak polling data to rail on black people the way that he did and to act as though black people are unified in a hatred of white people. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah. I mean, well, I think he, he probably was primed to go on that rant and the poll provided the excuse. You're right that it, it is weird. This is one of the reasons I think what he said is racist that he, you're right. He, he plucked out black people. Uh, their response to that question was, was not very different from non-white people generally, of whom fi fi only 58% said, yes, it's okay. And I agree. It's a weird question. That, and people are thinking like whiteness, where they're thinking of like white privilege, I hope. I will say that, you know, my, and we've talked before, and I've mentioned this before, I don't have a large number of experiences in my life. You know, this is just my personal experience. I don't have a large number of experiences where I felt like my race is really working against me. It's a pretty small number. And when that has happened, it's almost always a white person who's doing it to me. <laughs> I've almost never gotten that from a black person or a Hispanic person. It's almost always some white people who think white person who thinks the right thing to do is to make is to you know not hire me or make me feel guilty or, or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I can see how that is. In my experience, I mean, we're in the realm of anecdote now, but in my experience, yeah, you know, whether I'm you know with my you know, high school friends, or if I'm, you know, you know, the, <laughs> to use a cliche, if I'm in the barbershop, which is a real place where, where black people really do go to get their hair cut and talk, I have never really heard black people just railing on white people as individuals. I've never, I've heard black people decry what they feel is racism they've experienced. I've also heard black people really be quite you know, supportive of, of, you know, of white people they encounter in real life. But I've just never encountered this kind of fantasy of uh, black yeah. people as a hate group that Scott Adams conjures in his tirade. And what, what really kind of depressed me, and again, I really don't know how much, you know, I might just be on Twitter too much. I don't know how seriously to take this stuff, but the amount you, of people you are, in my continue. comments who were saying, <laughs> that, you know, he's got a point or actually like, you know, look at all the videos of, you know, of, of, of black people being violent towards white people or look at the CRT rhetoric that Chris Rufo has alerted us to. I, I was just astonished by how many people were willing to at least play the devil's advocate online and say that he had a point. It, yeah, it, that, it, that sucks. Yeah, that, that sucks. I mean, if you if you sure in a country this big, if you search hard enough, you're you, you know, you're going to find some shocking video. Um, you can find some radical online saying something that is racist against white people. All those things are possible. But if that's all you're seeing, if that's what's in your Twitter feed all the time, I think you're probably curating your feed to give you that content. You know, my personal experience is not <laughs> my personal experience. Here's my very most recent personal experience with race relations. I live in Washington, D.C. My mom has recently moved to Washington, D.C. from Southern Virginia. She lives near me now. She has joined a senior line dancing group, and she's the only white lady in the group. Everybody else is black. They have been so friendly to her. It has been such a welcome to D.C. from this group of elderly women. They're the Dazzlin', Dazzlin Diamonds, folks. If you're in D.C. and you want to see some good R&B <laughs> line dance, check out the Dazzlin' Diamonds. My mom is the white lady. 
uh, they, they've been so welcoming to her. It's been so nice. She's in a new city. She's an older lady. It's been really great. And I feel in my personal experience, and like you said, we're in the realm of anecdote. In my personal experience, that type of experience is far more common than the opposite. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, it, it makes me wonder the extent to which, you know, we're really getting a false idea of ourselves and each other through this kind of funhouse mirror of social media. You know, when I go on to Twitter, I see these, I do, I also, I, I, I try to, you know, get them out of my timeline as much as possible, but you see these horrific videos of racialized violence and it's, it's you know, they're rough stuff. Yeah. I mean, Yesterday, there was a video going around. I couldn't watch it. I just I kept popping up on my timeline of a man actually um, loading his gun slowly and executing a homeless man on the street in Jesus. California. It, it was horrific. Uh, and, you know, several of my friends also, you know, were commenting on in WhatsApp groups and stuff. But it's just like, what to what end um, are all these videos being shared and to, to, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like the same thing. It's, it, it's from the other angle, you know, what was happening, I think, um, to an extent with the videos of police violence in an enormous nation with an enormous amount of encounters, you know, you have this kind of sense that, you know, there's always a kind of, you know, um, well, the, I mean, the, the, the videos, they, they grab you emotionally, right? Right. They grab you emotionally. They are shocking. They're, they're good Twitter content for that reason. I think you're also right that people then extrapolate and say, well, this is, this is how it is all the time, even though, well, right. it, this, is, this is one thing that happened in this instance. It, it's good, yeah, it's good, good Twitter content, good. <laughs> almost certainly bad for society. And then when Scott Adams uh, <laughs> goes on his YouTube channel and uh, says, well, here, here's the, the last bit of proof you needed a poll that proves the anecdotes. That's, uh, in my opinion, that's not anything that's going to bring us together or uh, lead to a better society. Yeah, it's... Uh, we... and maybe it's time, we, yeah, it may be time to move on from that. It's too depressing. <laughs> yeah, now that we're nice and depressed. <laughs> we thought, well, let's start with a light one. Dilbert. We'll talk about Dilbert. Now we're nice and depressed. Um why don't we move on to child migrant labor? Oh, okay. That, that's, <laughs> that's a light subject. Yeah. Let's lighten the mood a little bit. And I So I put this one on the agenda because, so we called the podcast Wrong Think. We got like, to we have the hottest takes, right? At least we got to have something. Some tepid takes. Yeah. We got we yeah, to have something. Get, get say something that you actually do believe. Don't be an edgelord just to be an edgelord, but say something you actually do believe that is a hot take. So uh, I said, all right, let's put this one on the agenda because I got something here. As we approach this topic, let me say, I'm already getting cold feet. I'm like, why did I do this? <laughs> you were bolder so, in the Google document. All right. So let me preface this by saying <laughs> I am not a monster, okay? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a good ethical human being, but here we go. New York Times had an article this week, very long investigation, very well done in my opinion about child migrant laborers. What is happening in a nutshell, I will do my best to summarize the situation. Large numbers of unaccompanied minors are coming to the United States. The Biden administration, for understandable reason, reasons, is pushing hard to get these kids out of shelters. And we're talking about kids who are, in many cases, 13, 14, 15. They come to the country, once again, unaccompanied. They're in shelters. Biden is trying to get them out because obviously a shelter is not a good place to be. They are often put with a, a family member if one's available. Many times a family member is not available, so they might get released to a sponsor. And many of these children end up working jobs that are a violation of U.S. labor laws. And they're not violations because the kids are here legally, because they're not here legally. They're, they're sort of, they're mostly asylum cases that, asylum cases that are pending. The government is aware that they're here. It's not a labor violation for that reason. It's a labor violation because they are kids and they are working. They are too young to be working the jobs they are working. They're often working dangerous jobs. The hours are often extremely long. It's brutal. We were just talking about emotional responses to stuff. Well, if you read this article, you will have an emotional response because what these kids are being put through is just terrible. Now for my hot take. And did I mention that I'm not a monster? <laughs> Please keep that in mind as I get to my hot take. All right. 
I think the natural inclination for any well-meaning person is to read this story and go, oh my God, shut it all down. The, the, you know, these companies should absolutely not be employing these kids. They must not have these jobs. This has to stop this instant. I don't necessarily agree with, uh, disagree with that as I've just phrased it. We have labor laws for good reason. We need to enforce these labor laws. Congress and the White House are now looking at things. We might have some changes to at least the enforcement of these laws in the near future. The thing that I hope people keep in mind, and I think the thing is that is often absent from this discussion, is that sometimes you will have a person who is in such a desperate situation, and these kids, without a doubt, are frequently in desperate situations. Sometimes the worst thing you could possibly do to that person is say, you're fired. We are going to need to enforce our labor laws. These kids are in a number of different situations. Some are being exploited by their sponsors. Their sponsors will say, hey, you owe me $3,000 in rent this month. How are you going to pay that $3,000? That's not every kid's situation. Sometimes they're sending money back that's to the like, country they came like from. That's like New York City rent right there. That's, that's Williamsburg rent right there. Yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, I picked 3000 <laughs> <laughs> out of just out of the clear blue sky. But yes, yeah, sometimes the sponsors are exploiting them. They're, yeah. they're, they are saying, you owe me this money and working off this job is the only way you can make this money. Um, I just want to point out that I think sometimes well-meaning people will, they will try to make decisions for people who are in desperate situations. In this case, it would be saying, no, you cannot work that job. I just want, I just hope people keep in mind we should keep the actual desires of the person in mind. It might, sometimes they might actually want to work the job. And I understand that the word want is complicated in that sentence because what, want because their parent is forcing them, want because their parent is saying, hey, you need to send money back home. But I, I just worry about a situation where well-meaning people make it so these kids can't work a job and, and, and in an awful way they kind of need to. So am I canceled? Am I making any sense at all? I mean, you're, you're talking about a situation with, with like no good, no perfectly good or clean outcomes. Uh, the person's yes. in the country already because of a very bad situation. You're talking about what's the least of the evils on offer it's 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 yeah it's really no i don't think that you should be canceled for that for that uh oh, that's good <laughs> for that take but uh, you know i am troubled maybe it's maybe it's that this society simply doesn't offer the kind of social safety nets where um you know a child shouldn't be in a position where they would be needing to work or wanting to work or desiring to work. And, you know, the article mentioned a student in high school working 12 hour shifts at an egg processing factory and falling asleep in class. I mean, you, yeah. you're on a treadmill of, uh, of, of kind of really tough work that you won't get off of if you can't. Yeah. Um, perform and that's another place class. where it's super tricky, isn't it? Because these kids aren't American citizens. They 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 came here. They're claiming asylum, but they're not citizens. They're again they're, they're claiming asylum, so they're kind of pending. And it seems like uh, it seems like a logical solution might be okay. You say they cannot work these jobs. The end. And we are going to have a strong social safety net for them. But then if you do, and maybe I'm, maybe that is a solution. But then if you do that, you're going to get a lot more unaccompanied minor kids because you have yeah. you have made it explicit. Come come here and we will cover your rent and everything. So I, uh, the you know, thorniness I, is I, all I'm promoting. The, Just acknowledge the thorniness. It's terrible. I, I always fall on the side of be very selective with the amount of people that get access uh, they get in and then and then treat the people that actually do get in as as well as possible as humanely as possible um easier said than done right but yeah right i just I, think that there's something about uh, a 15 year old working overnight 12 hour overnight shifts at an egg processing factory that's very difficult to wrap my mind around i i agree but let's so now that now that I'm you know I'm already ten feet underwater, let me just keep diving <laughs> you go to the deeper, go deep. here. 
Um, <laughs> because these uncomfortable labor, labor situations, they frequently come up when we're talking about labor overseas, right? Um, and you would frequently have people working in situations overseas that, that are not situations that we as Americans are comfortable right. with. We, we right. look at them and we go, that looks like a real bad job. That would be illegal if it was in the United States. How do I feel about that? And I do feel that sometimes a well-meaning privileged person, you know, like myself in the United States, I'll try to apply my own um, beliefs about what should happen and what should not happen. And I will make, basically make decisions for somebody overseas who is in a desperate situation. Because I know that the reality is, and I know this, you know, from, I was in the Peace Corps for a little while. I've had, you know, parts of my family have lived overseas uh, in, not in, not in Paris like yourself, Thomas, but in, in very poor parts of the world. Many times you have a person who is in a desperate situation and they're thinking, I want to work in that Levi's plant. By my standards, that's a good job. Because my plan B isn't a law firm. My plan B is not some six-figure job. My plan B is something even worse. I say Levi's plant because when I was in Peace Corps in Morocco, that was the plant in the town I lived in. And those were considered good jobs, even though most Americans would go, oh, how much? It wasn't like, a, right. to my knowledge, a, short, a sweatshop. But it was like wages that Americans would would think were not very good. But in that town, it was a good job. So I do think sometimes there is an element of, no, but I'm stepping in and making this decision for you. You cannot work at the Levi's plant. You're welcome. You're fired. You're welcome. That's this. That's what I worry about. Yeah, I, there does have to be a different calculation when we're talking about how we view jobs done abroad and what we are willing to permit within the bounds of our own society, right? And uh, you know, this issue is so complex because the the article is talking about children who are sometimes, you know, they're not necessarily with joining family or parents. They're being put up by hosts who are like yeah. demanding uh, a certain amount of financial contribution, sometimes at, at, at exorbitant levels. And so without basically without the government providing some type of um floor below which the the, the children can't fall uh, they're going to end up trying to fix the situation on their own and that's going to lead to them entering into labor uh, agreements that are going to be very difficult for i think uh privileged white men like yourself who we're still not sure it's okay to be uh, um, <laughs> uh not necessarily uh feeling comfortable with uh, god i hope it's okay because i feel like i don't have any options i, I feel like i'm stuck with this well we'll scott adams actually decided he jo he was <laughs> Willing to join the winning team. <laughs> and, and, and how's he, that going for him? Identifying as black. How's that going for him? You're black. <laughs> Has he been embraced with open arms, would you say? <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the strangest thing about that is that he probably did get um, some love. You, you know, because it's a big, beautiful, strange, complicated country. Some sure. people probably did welcome him with open arms. You know, you can find Owens, probably, here. right? <laughs> <laughs> that's what i want i want to be uh walking around the street in dc one day and see uh candace owens and scott adams on a tandem bike <laughs> that's gonna make my fucking day when i see that <laughs> one last thing about the uh the, the child labor now that i'm thoroughly canceled i can't you know it, it's it's already over so might as well keep going i think as congress is considering stuff and you know predictably republicans <laughs> Are looking at the Biden administration role, uh, Biden Biden administration's role in this. Democrats are looking at corporations' role in this. Everyone's, you know, defaulting to their pre-existing um, issues. I think the area that might bear the mo most fruit is looking at the sponsors. Clearly, some of these sponsors are exploiting these kids. These sponsors, some of them, the worst ones. I think you could describe as child traffickers. And I think um, better vetting or possibly cracking down on those sponsors might be a, a good good way to make the best of a admittedly terrible situation. Yeah, then you'd have to, people would have to care. And I guess this is a question, uh, and I think I already sadly know the answer. This is a question, to what extent do people genuinely care about something like this? And to what extent is it just something vaguely disturbing that then we, we, you know, we all forget about the kid working overnight shifts in the egg processing factory? Yeah. I mean, 
It's so, dark. It's someone's dark. gonna work an overnight shift in the eggplant. Is there anything even... lighter on the docket than we we, we got? As um, dark no, no. Uh, child, <laughs> child look at look at looking at the topic list here. Like a uh, review of the Armenian genocide. No, <laughs> no it's a, let's let, yeah, let's move on to something lighter. Uh, I agree. Um, why don't we talk about Ron DeSantis? Because <laughs> you're you're Mister Free Speech. When people don't call you TC Dubs, they're always calling you Mister Free Speech. <laughs> and um, you have written a lot about free speech and the importance of it. And, and so have I. Once again, people read your stuff a lot more than they read mine. But I want people to know I have also written on my blog about free speech. And frequently, you and I write about left-wing constrictions on free speech mm-hmm. because left-wing constrictions are the ones that have been popping up a lot in recent years. Um, but what happened this week is Ron DeSantis has created a board to oversee the special district in which Disney operates. This is the place where Disney gets a bunch of tax breaks. This is partly because much of the right is up in arms about some content that has been appearing on Disney shows recently, specifically the show The Pride Family, has had some viral clips among right-wing Twitter. And it is also an extension of the feud Ron DeSantis got in with Disney when Disney expressed opposition to DeSantis' parental rights and education bill. That's the one people called the Don't Say Gay bill. I I wanted to talk about this just to note that though we've spent a lot of time talking about left-wing constrictions on speech, it's not like the right is great on this either. Ron DeSantis, I would say his uh, record on free speech is very, very, very bad. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. You know, I've actually, you know, you just cannot please, these speech wars are very difficult. You cannot please anybody um, if you try to remain unaligned with uh, the ideologues who, who are really fighting it out. But, you know, what's happening from the right is obviously um, atrocious. You know, the, the, the banning of things like, you know, um, ta Coates is between the world and me uh, on AP exams, yeah. the, the, you know, forcing the college board to get rid of texts that are really, they're not, not only are they not objectionable, but they are actually, you know, disagree with some of these texts, but they're, they're important uh, for knowing our cultural era. Um, they are worthy of students' time and attention. You know, banning these things, making librarians afraid, making teachers terrified, um, it's authoritarianism. It's inspired by some of the more unsavory figures on the world stage, like Viktor Orban in Hungary, taking pages out of uh, these people's playbooks. Um, I've written also, you know, in the Harper's letter, we were pretty clear that the the, the, the gravest censoriousness comes from, you know, the Trumpian right, which DeSantis is vying for. Um, I've written, you know, op, an op-ed, uh, against the anti-CRT bills in the New York Times, along with David French and Camille Foster. You know, no matter how many times you try to bring up your credentials for opposing the right-wing stuff, um, it's never satisfactory because people say that you can't equate the two. How are you getting upset about this kind of vague censoriousness that comes from the left when there are actual authoritarians on the right? But my um, contribution to the wrong thing... That's what that is. Yeah, my contribution to the wrong thing today would be that what Ron DeSantis is doing is 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 obviously very wrong. It's it's unambiguous the way that the kind of speech that Scott Adams was indulging in is unambiguous racism. This is unambiguously bad. Um, we can kind of all of us who are not supporting it can kind of agree that it's bad. We can seek to vote against him. We can oppose it. I would still say that what is happening on the other side, while not as explicitly egregious. Um, is probably actually more important and worthy of sustained uh, criticism and attention because of the way that it operates uh, in such a widespread manner. It's not isolated to just Florida. It's not one person's political program. It's the kind of atmosphere that pervades um, elite institutions um, from artistic institutions to media to, to, to think tanks to, you know, nonprofits to academia. I mean, it, it, to Hollywood. It's the kind of 
air that we swim in. And it's not an explicit program that you can vote yes or no on. It's something that kind of, you know, just changes the climate around you. And, you know, it's oftentimes, you know, it it changes it gradually and you don't fully understand or appreciate the degree to which you're giving up, you're ceding the kind of um, freedom to express yourself and to even make mistakes. And so I think that is much more of a challenge. It is true, isn't it? That you can vote Ron DeSantis out of office. You cannot uh, create a cultural change in every university in the United States in a short period of time. I would also say it's not certainly not limited to Ron DeSantis. As you noted, uh, Donald Trump's record is also piss poor. Frankly, I think uh, the Republican Party in general, they've shown a lot of ability to criticize the left when the left is too censorious. Um, they have not shown a deep commitment to free speech, in in my opinion. And DeSantis is just an illustration of that. I, I will say, yeah, which is worse? I, I always try to avoid the which is worse game. Because right. the, the answer is usually I don't know. The answer is usually I don't know and I don't care. Because <laughs> what I'm more interested in doing is just pointing out when it exists, I'm against it. <laughs> when, yeah. when people are, are not um, allowing, I think, the wide range of speech, the wide range of opinions that I think is necessary to a healthy society. And I, I will say, once again, that doesn't mean anything goes. There's the classic fire in a crowded theater example. I thought Dilbert got on the wrong side of the fire in a crowded theater line. It's, you know, I, I don't want him... Uh, sent off to St. Helena to rot until he dies, but I am also not upset that his cartoons are being pulled from newspapers. Um, we generally need a wide breadth, and, and and I'm just comfortable saying, well, when it happens, I'm against it. If it happens on the left, I'm against it. If it happens on the right, I'm against it. Which is worse? Uh, I don't know. That's up, up to somebody else to measure. Yeah, it's a good policy to just be against it when you see it. I mean, I... Um... I think that I do take seriously this idea that, you know, one of the critiques I got um, when you talk about, you know, what is fair in fostering an atmosphere of censoriousness is that if you don't allow for pushback, not just against the egregious cases, you know, the pornography, we know it when we see it, uh, can't define it, but know it when you see it, there's a difference between it and art. Um, If you don't allow for a kind of wide berth of, you know, shifting, if you don't allow people to, to set new norms, if you only oppose the things that violate established norms, you're, 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 you're favoring the status quo in such a way that it's difficult to imagine how social progress gets made. You can go back in time and you could say at some point, most people, it was established norm that the type of stuff that Scott Adams was saying was fine. And so how do you get to the, how do you get the progress that you need? I take that seriously. I think we should be maximally tolerant and we should really use uh, uh, quite a lot of discretion when we think about what it means to actually um, subject someone to what is a social and professional death in many situations. And so that's why I also don't Mm. think the thing with Scott Adams Adams, uh, reaches the level of cancel culture because There was no campaign, actually. The companies that he worked for simply decided they didn't want to associate with him because he had violated, you know, something so clearly. It is true, uh, isn't it, that so often what we're doing is we're just all making individual choices about what we want to consume and what we don't. And we're confronted with this issue of, you know, separating the art from the artist all the time. And yes, I am saying art in reference to Dilbert. But like it comes up all the time, right? It's like you still watch Roman Polanski movies. Do you listen to Michael Jackson? There's nobody who can possibly avoid making these decisions. Um, I will say it, it is a lot easier to me when it's Dilbert. It's like, I feel like Will Smith is going to be back because he's Will Smith. And there aren't a lot of Will Smiths in the world. <laughs> it happened. Um, do you remember I don't when Megan Kelly? I don't think that you should lose your career for <laughs> for for what Will Smith did. Uh, the, the, yeah, let the punishment the, fit the crime, right? Yeah, the other let thing the, is the, 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 what is described as cancel culture is often, you know, rooted in a, a very disproportionate response to whatever the transgression, whether right, perceived right. or real, was thought to be. Right. Does anybody really believe that what Will Smith did 
you know, slapping Chris Rock, who made a crude joke about his wife. You know, does anybody believe that you should know if for 10 years you can't attend the Academy Awards? You know, th th you should be a pariah. You should not be able to hold your head up in, in polite society. I mean, it's ridiculous. No, I, it, it, I, I, can, I can only speak for myself. My personal opinion is um, I, th I really liked Will Smith before that. I thought he was a really cool guy. And uh, then he did that. I'm like, oh, I, I think he, uh, he <laughs> he's a bit of an asshole. Um, but it's certainly not beyond redemption. Is that what the punishment he got? Ten years at the Academy Awards? Yeah. Can't come for yeah, ten yeah. years? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I well, think that's, that's got to be because they got so much heat because they didn't throw him out on the night. Yeah, he still got to, you know, be celebrated. But I think that's just insane. But, you know, like not to conflate the issues, but but just to finish on DeSantis, you know, I, I think mm -hmm. it goes without saying that when, you know, when your freedom is violated by the state, it's 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 a very serious matter. I think that, yes, um, you keep so that's why we object to, you know, um, that's why the what about, you know. Black on black violence, uh, whenever, you know, people get upset about police officers killing unarmed black people. That's why that argument doesn't stick, because it's there is something very severe about the state fundamentally violating yes. you. That's not the same when it's just coming from other fellow citizens. With that I, said, I'm really glad. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I just I'm, I'm really glad you made that point because I completely agree. It is way, way worse when it is coming from the state. That's always what you hear when when. You're talking about cancel culture, which for the millionth time is, a, is that's a phrase I don't use. I'm, I'm saying it because other people are saying it. Somebody will always pop up and say, well, it's not a first, first Amendment violation because the First Amendment only deals with government censorship, which, of right. course, is correct. It doesn't mean that censorship coming from other sources is therefore good. Right. But this is the government. And I hope people realize what he's doing is absolutely trying to intimidate Disney into doing whatever it is he wants them to do. And, you know, speaking as somebody who, who writes for television, like, yeah, that's going to, that's going to have an impact. I can very easily see some show either getting picked up or not getting picked up. Some storyline getting used or not getting used an actor getting hired or not getting hired. Yeah, Absolutely. Like that would put a thumb on the scale when those decisions are being made. I mean, he pretty clearly changed the college board's, um, thought process uh, when it came to the AP African American history uh, offering, you know, and there's a lot to be said about that. There were things in that um, in that class that I didn't necessarily agree with either. But to have the kind of you know the kind of authoritarianism unleashed, uh, it is disturbing. And to have somebody doing that who's got you know much larger ambitions. It's something that we should be paying quite a lot of attention to. So I don't, I, you know, I, I don't conflate the two issues, but I think, like you said, we should be objecting to this stuff um, wherever we see it. And wh why choose? Why is it an either or? Right, right. Well, and yeah, so it's coming from the right, it's coming from the left. Where does a person who cares about free speech go? This podcast, clearly. I'm, I'm the mean, only that, answer. <laughs> You know, where are the liberals? You know, yeah, where, where, are, the, where are the people that uh, are, you know, not playing for a team but are, are opposed to that from whichever, um, yeah. from whichever place it's coming from? I'm always getting called not a liberal these days because I'm pro-free speech, pro-due process, and I don't think race is a meaningful category. What and then I always have people what on Twitter going, oh, now? you're not a liberal. It's like, I feel like those are core liberal things. Core liberal <laughs> values. Like are... <laughs> What's that? Core liberal values. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And as of very recently, as of very recently, core liberal values. Well, if nothing else, uh, we have made one podcast. What do you think <laughs> of that? Here's here's to the first and uh man it's it's a pleasure talking with you. Um I think we're going to get Likewise. to the bottom of what's wrong with the world here. I think we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal by episode 3 if we haven't cracked this. Yeah. I'm going to be very disappointed in us. I'm planning on it. I'm planning on it. Okay. Well, we'll do it again next week. Good talking to you as always. Good talking to you too. See you next Take week. Take care, man.